I've come to like it was when I when I realized I knew what was going to happen in the fight. Uh, all all the rage drained away from me. So you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, but not you're not necessarily okay. <laughs> you're not necessarily saying you know the result. I think I do. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think I know everything now. Wow. Now you realize yeah. you've said this with so much confidence. <laughs> you either have to say it again during the actual show, or this has to be the cold open. Oh, hell yes, I'm gonna do it in the show. Okay. <laughs> hell yeah. I love a, I love a confident pick, especially on this, especially on this fucking show. <laughs> Welcome, one and all, to another edition of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, is Phil McKenzie. And we have UFC 252 right on our doorstep. It is just ahead of us. The long-awaited rubber match between Stipe Miocic, once again the heavyweight champion, and Daniel Cormier. Uh, a fight which inspires, I think, in the two of us, Phil, all sorts of powerful emotions um although something has changed in your mindset because i recall last week you becoming extremely irate at the mere thought of this matchup uh just a sort of general prejudice against heavyweights i believe uh and the fact that the stupidest tiniest adjustments can be made and totally change the nature of a matchup um but i believe you're coming into this episode with a uh, a revised viewpoint as uh, people who listened to the cold open will know, an extreme degree of confidence in your pick, which in no way makes me excited to to rub it in your face when uh, the other thing just necessarily happens. Um, so I hope I, I'm looking forward to hearing that from you, Phil. Of course, there's the rest of UFC 252, one that we are really excited to cover: Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera. Kind of a tough one to figure out, to be honest. Um, We've also got Junior Dos Santos versus Jairzinho Rosenstreich, which is as fitting an execution, I think, as any former heavyweight contender deserves. John Dotson versus Marab Duwalish Willie, and probably the greatest rematch of all time. Magomed Ankalaev versus Oscar winner Iwan Kutalaba. Yes. Really, really looking forward to discussing <laughs> that one with no technical analysis whatsoever. Um, if you want to hear us talk a little bit about the Lewis Olenek card that happened last weekend, we are going to reserve that for a quick bonus episode. So make sure you check out the Heavy Hands Patreon to uh, hear all of that. Otherwise, it's on to UFC 252. And Phil, the main event. First of all, why did it make you so mad uh, initially, this matchup? Because it, cause it's been so stupid. Yes. And... I've gotten it wrong every t- both the last two times. That's the re- that's that's the real nub of it, isn't it? Bill? <laughs> it's defied and, both of our understandings of this sport. And watching the fights after I made my picks, I merely found both times I just found myself thinking that wasn't necessarily a bad pick, but mm-hmm. I just wasn't ready for how stupid this fight was. Yeah. It wasn't a because bad pick first... in that it would have made it would have made sense to have played out the way you saw it, <laughs> but what happened? Yeah. This, I mean, so the yeah. first time uh, we basically said Stipe should win this one. Mm-hmm. He is the better fighter. He is the larger man, the bigger hitter, mm-hmm. uh, the more uh, technical boxer. His one problem is that he's a he's an absolute void in the clinch, and so and true enough, uh, Cormier kept finding the clinch and eventually kind of clobbered him from there. Yep. Uh, in the rematch, they're like, well, Cormier seems to be able to get out to like big early leads because Stipe isn't dressing the clinch game, so he's just sort of either opening himself up to strikes or punches. So I guess even though he does still seem like the better fighter, we're going to have to pick Cormier here. And then 
Stipe just let Cormier run out to a giant lead <laughs> until they both got pretty tired and Stipe decided to punch him in the belly and won. A bunch of times. An adjustment which occurred to him in the fourth round, which was the same round that that adjustment led to the finish. It did seem to come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. I've slightly re- revised my view on the sort of arc, uh, the narrative arc of that fight, um, but uh, I more or less agree. And so the third matchup comes and you're thinking, well... Yeah, I, I'm thinking there's no right way to yeah. um, to call this fight because the obvious thing is that you can say if Steve just realizes that he, attacks the, the, he can attack the body, then he's going to win this. But there's nothing to imply from like the last two fights that he's going to realize that in time. And so it end up, ended up kind of leading itself to really facile analysis of, well, if he does this, then, yep. um, then he'll win. But will he do it? But then I kind of thought about how the fight would actually play out. And I thought, what if I... What if you go? What if I went about it the other way? What if I tried to think of what the stupidest outcome was? Mm. And it's pretty comfortable that I could do that. And so I am now comfortable <laughs> with my pick. Uh, is that a cell phone <laughs> that you were able to con- conceive of the stupidest outcome? Yeah, I think I know what the stupidest outcome is now. All right. And so is that? Are you are you teasing that? And we're gonna we're gonna mm-hmm. unpack it as we go. Okay. Yep. Well, all right. So I may as well dive in with, I agree with your, your analysis. Uh, you know, the first matchup, of course, the, the clinch ended up being a major factor. It was still often a factor in the second fight. Um, I mean, I think it can't be denied that in that second fight, Stipe made some serious adjustments to how he approached the first one, right? He, he was way uh-huh. less aggressive. That was like number one. That was the main thing is that he was not insistent on pressing, pressing forward and really only started to do it at all, uh, in the third round, I think. Um, so that was different. He didn't want to pressure. He wasn't willingly crashing into the clinch quite so much, although he still did kind of do that when he got back to pressuring. I don't think he can help it. Um, the other thing is, uh, yeah, he, he clearly wanted to enforce that distance with his jab. It was like the first strike he threw in the fight. It was by far the most effective one until he discovered that left hook to the body. Um, the other thing that stood out to me on this most recent rewatch though was that, um, I can, I have problems with the way Stipe approached it. Like he wasn't even doing what his corner asked him to, uh, in terms of footwork that came out after he got comfortable which leads me to believe he was working over some kind of mental hurdle uh, in the beginning of that fight, um, maybe suffering under the pressure or whatever. But uh, one thing that did stand out to me is that um, Stipe is a way subtler uh, puncher than Cormier. Cormier is very, very quick. But one thing Cormier almost never does, um, and I don't know that I've ever hit upon this before, is faint. The guy does not mm. faint. He reaches out and grabs your hands. Uh, so he could, he, he'll use that to put you in a, in a less defensible position. But at that point, it's all speed. It's all about hand speed, darting in, just quickly striking the targets. And I, I think in the first fight, like that really told, um, Miocic was aggressive. He obviously got in on Cormier because Cormier's defense is pretty bad. And then Cormier was like, I have to exchange with him started just throwing combinations, very much like how he answered the pressure from Volkan Ustamir. And the speed made a big difference. In a more neutral kind of fight the second time around, with with uh, Miocic not insisting on pressure and Cormier pressuring, but, you know, in his way of walking forward, controlling the hands, darting in with jabs, um, the exchanges were, they were more neutral than I remembered, actually. I think the fight was closer than I remembered. And I, and I think the thing that allowed Miocic to stay in with Cormier's hand speed was the fact that he could actually faint and change his rhythm. Uh, it was a matter of timing being the only thing that saved him because it really stood out to me the speed difference between these two guys watching that second fight just now. Um, Cormier's hands are so much quicker than Miocic's. Everything he does is so much quicker than Miocic. But he does not have that subtlety of timing or setup that Miocic has. So I, I was appreciating that a little more, that Miocic was actually able to throw Cormier off and get in with his counters. 
The thing I didn't like is that he was like – he put himself in a situation where he really had to exchange with Cormier because he was just standing in front of him for most of the fight. Um, you know, not pressing forward, which I guess isn't it is a, is an upgrade, but not really evading either. Not until he got comfortable. Uh, it was really just standing in front and trying to counter. It was a really counter punching based performance for Miocic, which is, I, I don't know, kind of weird. Um, so yeah, that, that was my take on, on the rematch. Did you, you, do you still see it as a, as, as Cormier just mopping Miocic? Uh, no, not really. Like, like you said, I mean, there were a few adjustments that he made. You know, he clearly wanted some adjustments that were gonna be more clinch neutral. Like, we, we also saw some more, like, stepping knees from, yeah. uh, Miocic. Um, but, yeah, it, it felt like a very heavyweight set of adaptations. Is right. that, like, this guy was bad for me at close range, so. I'm going to fight this fight at long range. Yeah. And and still didn't I mean, necessarily that do was, that all that well. A lot of that fight was right in the pocket, which his corner kept yelling at him about. Yeah. And there were he didn't he wasn't really able to address the clinch in any particular way either. Yeah. You know, uh he wasn't able to like cross fight or control the the hands the same way that Cormier did that uh like Jones did against Cormier. It was pretty much he just ran into the same clinch exchanges repeatedly, uh, but he just survived them this time, mm-hmm. and until like they were both pretty tired. Yeah, and, I think he just maybe he... knew that right hand was coming, <laughs> and that was the difference because yeah. it definitely landed plenty of times in the second fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean there is, but one one of the dynamics in. In, in this fight really did come through, which is that that speed and that explosion from Cormier really doesn't last across five rounds. Yes, correct. And we've, we've never seen it last across five rounds, really. And, um, as his corner told him, the only answer, like, he has to pressure. He has to pressure mm-hmm. and he has to keep throwing. And now you could see it on his face leading into the fourth round. Uh, you know, after the second round, he went to his corner and he was like, did I lose a round? It was clear his confidence was waning. Um, and he was, I mean, his stamina was waning. I, that had to, everything to do with it. But, uh, going into the fourth round, it was like, he's tired and they're like, okay, fight smart. That's what they said to him. Fight smart. What does fighting smart mean? Well, they quickly address that. Throw, throw your punches, move forward, <laughs> which is like, that's, yeah, he can't do that indefinitely. Um, not against a bigger puncher, I don't think. It, it becomes much riskier than at light heavyweight, where he can just keep somebody like Gustafson on the back foot. Um, I don't know. Anyway, please go. Yeah, on. the problem with the problem with Cormier is that his game is bolted together from several very high uh intensity pieces. Yeah, he has uh kind of explosive bursts of forward motion when he's punching. Uh, he has uh like just general constant forward motion into, you know, into strikes. He, as you said, he constantly has to pressure just to juice his, his size and his, his basic, mm-hmm. let's be honest, his, his lack of defense as well. Yep. Um, so he constantly has to press, press forward. He can't really sit in neutral exchanges with someone like Steve, as you mentioned, because he'll just get absolutely tuned up by the jab. He constantly has to be walking forward and countering everything. Um, and thirdly is his wrestling game. Uh, which is again, like, um, it's very high, it's very high, uh, effort and mm-hmm. only against like really physically outmatched or technically poor right. opponents has it been particularly rewarding. And Miocic is strong and also a wrestler. Yeah. So he's a good wrestler and he's a, he's a good grappler as well. True. He's, he's hard to keep down. Yes. He's, and it meant that uh whilst Cormier was able to get takedowns from him, it was very debatable as to who actually benefited more from that. Right. And in fact the truth is probably that much like Jones before him, mm-hmm. the answer was probably uh Stipe. Right. That that really the dynamic is even though Cormier is is more famed for his durability, I think, than Stipe, the dynamic does seem to be that if Stipe can survive, 
the fight is always going to trend in his favor because he's still going to be landing with power. Uh, after Cormier's speed starts to wane, that snap starts to leave his punches. Miocic is still going to have heavier hands. Um, and yeah, I just think the, the size advantage too, although I don't know how much he actually outweighs Cormier. Probably not much actually. Probably not actually that much. Yeah. Yeah. Although he's certainly leaner than a heavyweight Cormier, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. But, but again, this does still feel very much like, oh, he won this one, so now I'm going to pick him here. So tell me, what is the stupidest outcome? Uh, how does Cormier destroy himself and then end up winning anyway? Well, so <laughs> the dynamic that we saw a lot in the second fight, I mean, in both the fights, really, it, we, we really saw like Cormier going for what uh, Jack Slack, you know, he calls the, the mummy guard. He's really reaching out for... Yeah, yeah. Uh, for Stipe so that he can turn his, he can basically deflect the jab and then turn it around into, into a clinch. Another energy demanding aspect of his game. Even his defense is aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also that thing which, which often leads him doing, doing that sort of hideous flailing when it, you know, yeah. when he gets hit by something in neutral space and it looks horrendous. It's great for us. He's, he's doing that, but his, from too far out. It's great for eye um, pokes, though. Most people don't think about this, but when you have your hand extended already, there's a relatively short distance between the end of your index finger and your opponent's eye. Yes. So. Yes, that is very true. <laughs> um, but um, as we've seen in, in a bunch of fights, that isn't necessarily that, and that approach was the one that allowed uh, Miosic to like really allowed him to start uh, lining up the body shots. Yeah. That specifically that but we have seen cormier fight like much more traditional uh in a, a much more traditional boxing stance mm -hmm. i mean specifically uh against jones in the second fight right mm -hmm. he, he fights pretty much from a very standard uh like yeah kickboxing stance he does he throws punch kick combinations mm -hmm. his elbows are by the side of his body he still does do you know cormier he still does that 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 defense, but he, because he's internalized uh, more that he shouldn't be clinching up with Jones, uh, he's clearly um, he's clearly like uh, learned that the the clinch isn't actually the place that he wants to fight Jones. Right. Um, so yeah, he's he's throwing combinations and punch kick, and and this sort of speaks to his ad adaptations in the. Um, Stipe fight as well, the second Stipe fight, because he's much more likely to um, counter the jab with with low kicks in that fight as well. I think we saw him low kicking more. Yeah, um, not a, still not a ton, and, really, but yeah. And I think this sort of speaks to who Cormier is as a fighter, that he is someone who, he you know, he, he is an analyst on the, on the sport, on the, the desk for the UFC. Mm -hmm. He does, you know, he's a trainer. He he comes in with game plans. He comes in prepared for his opponents, and so. But as I think, you said, things are kind of bolted on. Yeah, I mean, it occasion you know it, it drains away over time. But he he comes in with with very specific game plans for his opponents. He mm -hmm. thinks very hard about it. He will. He you know we know he has been thinking very hard about the body shots. Mm -hmm. So, I think that you know what we see happen is that he comes in. Fights in a much more conventional uh, boxing kickboxing stance, and then Miosic basically uh, like just headhunts him to a <laughs> either decision or a or a late stoppage. And then in the post-fight interview, they talk to Miosic and they're like, "Okay, yeah, we noticed you didn't go to the body shots <laughs> any in this fight." Was that like a specific adaptation to Cormier's adaptation? And Miosic just looks really confused and just goes, Body shots? No, I just forgot. Yeah. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Not a very good Stipe, but you get the idea. And then, uh, yeah, and then presumably whilst uh, they're having like the tearful retirement speech from Cormier where he says, you know, he gave it everything and he wants people oh, to remember him God. for... You know, everything that he's done and to work hard and all that stuff. You can just sort of hear far off in the distance. You just hear Steve like, Oh yeah! Body shots! 
as he says, he finally remembers. <laughs> that that was what he was supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my prediction. So the idea is that Cormier, in a sort of, a, f- a fashion somewhat similar to a man we will be speaking about very soon, Junior Dos Santos, comes up with specific tools designed to address the specific tactical things that, that hurt him in the last fight. I don't even know if it's as much a, uh, it's as much like broad strategic thinking from Cormier, but I, I, I do agree. I think it's like, okay, this is an area where, where of my game where they had some success. I'm going to do this specific thing to address that. And your, your read is he does that. And then it turns out that it's not a factor because Stipe has forgotten about the body shots again. Yes, that and it, is, that's my pick. And that it allows Stipe to keep him at range and pick him apart more easily. That honestly does sound kind of right. Um, and I'm bummed because I thought your stupidest outcome was going to be Cormier winning. And uh, this means we're probably both going to be picking Miocic, which is <laughs> guarantees that Cormier is going to win, uh, at least based on the previous two fights. I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, Cormier does deserve to win. Uh, like you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be having heavyweight fights where your, your plan is to survive losing the first three rounds and then turn it round. Well, I mean, doesn't that right there make Stipe Miocic the greatest heavyweight of all time? <laughs> <laughs> who else could have done that? Uh, who else Derek could Lewis, if he'd somehow survived, yeah, perhaps. He really did his best Derek Lewis impression. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. Um, Shit, there was something else I was gonna say. I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think my main feeling is that the, the sort of shape of the fight, uh, inevitably favors the bigger, longer guy, uh, down the stretch. Cause I agree. I think Cormier's stamina is only getting worse as he's getting older. Um, and yeah, he just requires so much of that explosion. I'm not going to be as bold as you and predict a game plan because I don't think I've really successfully done that yet with these guys. Um, and the nature of heavyweight fighting is just that one small adjustment can make a tremendous difference because everything has such great consequences. Uh, whether it's you land a shot and it just detonates the other person's head or you miss one shot and your, your stamina bar drains down to zero in an instant – the consequences are dire. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give a read on the fight that confidently, but I, I do feel I now have the general feeling, which I'm sure is about to be disproved, that, uh, Cormier just cannot keep up the strategy he would need to use to win this fight down the stretch. Unless he knocks Stapey out early again. Which, as we said, he landed all of those shots in the second fight and very well could have. One one moment of flinching from Stipe, and it could have uh, we could be having no rubber match at all. So yeah, I mean, out of these two fights, Cormier has won whatever it is four of the five rounds and yep. knocked him out once. Yep. Uh, whereas Stipe has won one round and knocked him out once. Yep. Um. So yeah, in some ways, I like despite the fact that I'm still firmly convinced that Stipe is the better fighter. Yada yada. I think there's a in some ways, from what we've seen, like you just—I mean, you genuinely just shouldn't let heavyweights get large leads on you. And Cormier is always winning the early going in these fights. Yeah, that's the the only. And so I'm I'm, I'm sort of where I thinking in a in a stupid rational way about this. I, I might I would actually be tempted to pick him. I was very tempted to, to pick him until I thought it just wasn't it wasn't stupid enough. Yeah. And but now I'm 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 confident and happy in in my conclusion. It's a stupid sport, and Phil McKenzie is its prophet. All right. <laughs> when we return, we're going to be talking about Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera, the co-main event. Very exciting a bantamweight. Um, a cross, not even a crossroads. I don't know. It's just a, a contender-making fight. Um, I'm really into that one. The aforementioned JDS is taking on and probably depressingly losing to Jairzinho Rosenstrike. Um, John Dotson versus Marab Dualish, Willie Magomed on Kalaev, Iwan Kutalaba. And yes, you may have noticed, we're not going to be talking about anything on the prelims. It's because they suck in comparison. See? 
after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are moving on down the UFC 252 main card. Sean O'Malley versus Marlon Chito Vera is the co-main event. And, um, you know, my initial reaction to this match being made was uh, to be intensely nervous for my boy Chito, of course, because... You know, just as I was when he fought Song Yadong. Um, granted, in that fight, um, I'm actually not sure. Maybe you could look up MMA decisions for me, Phil, and tell me. I do feel like a lot of people thought Cheeto deserved the nod there. Um, I famously came on with the, uh, with a revolutionary post fight sadness hedge on this very podcast and claimed that, uh, Song Yadong had every right to win the decision, but of course, in my heart. I would have liked it to have been Cheeto. He did great though. Like, um, it's not uh, just just to clarify. I think on MMA decisions, I think it's actually it was a it was nine people for Cheeto and eight people for Yadong. So, so very very close. Very very close. And that that sounds about right to me. Um, I, I honestly could not have been upset with either guy taking that decision. It's not often that I. Um, I get really attached to a fighter, especially one uh, like Chito Vera, who's like known, like it's his idiosyncrasies that, that made me love him initially. It's the, the fact that, uh, you know, as you always say, Phil, that his, his fights are, are necessary therapy that he has to go through like a painful process of self discovery every single time he fights. Um, it's not often that I, I like a fighter like that. And then they become, capital A, capital G, actually good. But, uh, like, he's undeniably actually good. He has really proven to be a, a solid top flight bantamweight fighter. And, um, yeah, the main thing for that has just been, like, uh, becoming more confident and realizing that, like, um, getting hit and continuing to march people down and, and, and stay on top of them really works for him. And so, I was initially nervous here because Sean O'Malley is like Song Yadong before him, the next sort of really scary prospect in this division, which just seems to have an endless supply of such prospects. But, um, as it's come nearer, I'm, I'm like, uh, Cheeto might win. Um, and so am I conning myself, Phil? Or, uh, or might he win? Um, I think, yeah, this is, this is a really interesting one because this, this is where the rubber really hits the road for O'Malley. Yeah. This is one which I think is a, this is a significant stylistic step up for him as well as just a step up in terms of competition. Right. Because Eddie Wineland was, is a tough fighter in a number of ways, but he was also sort of, as we alluded to on the podcast, uh, tailor made for someone like O'Malley. Because he's incredibly slow on his feet and sort of relies on uh, head movement to get out the way of strikes. Someone who's just like a really accurate puncher who keeps high movement up. This was going to always just going to be a bit of a nightmare for him. Yeah. I mean, going all the way back to um, when he got knocked out by the uh, Novo Uniao striking coach. What's his name again? Ah, uh, Johnny Eduardo. Yes. And in fact, he ended up getting knocked out in almost exactly the same way. Yeah. By Sean O'Malley. Yeah. Very similar uh, right hand. Yep. Um, except in one of them, uh, he did the fatality wobble from Mortal Kombat, and in the <laughs> other, he was just dead. Um, yes. But yeah, Marlon Vera, very different kettle of fish. Uh, Marlon Vera presses pressure's much better. He cuts off the cage more. He uses uh, kicks and punches to herd people into shots. Mm -hmm. He's extremely violent in the clinch. 
Big body and puncher, too. That's kind of different from a lot of these other guys that uh, O'Malley's fought before. Sorry, what's that? Big body puncher as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, he's immortally durable, and he keeps a very high pace. Mm-hmm. And no one that O'Malley has fought has anything like those, yeah. that list of uh, attributes. I mean, uh, Joselle de Alberto Quinones is tough, but he doesn't have the offense. Uh, Wineland is technical, but slow. Sukuntar was, is just achingly slow paced. Yep, very um, low output. So. And Tarion Ware it, is pretty good, but not athletic enough for anyone to realize it. Yeah. And also just, you know, fell out of a time warp from, uh, an old timey, uh, Old, from old timey boxing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, so that, that Sukumtar fight, uh, it's hard to find an analog, but that Sukumtar fight does bring up some worrying things for O'Malley. It's one of his only decisions that we've seen in recent memory. Yep. He looked super ragged in the third, yeah. even before his, uh, foot went out. He was looking like his, his footwork was was really falling apart, and you know he was starting to look visibly gassed. Yeah. Um, and Andre Sukumtar does not is infamous for not keeping a high pace. Yes. It was O'Malley's um, own work that exhausted him. It can't have been anything else. Yeah. And uh, Sukumtar, as you mentioned before the show, and steal it. Um. He does like a high guard, and yeah. which allowed him to sort of take some of the shots off in a way that Wineland couldn't. Uh, Joe Rogan would be delighted to see that dynamic playing out. <laughs> he sure he would. He always hated Eddie Wineland. <laughs> You'd never coach anyone to <laughs> fight like that. You would never teach anyone to do this. Certainly not 70% of MMA fighters who don't keep a high guard. Um, yeah, I, I, fans of the show, uh, and also enemies uh, and haters will know that I I'm, I'm no like a great advocate of the high guard as a um as many people are many people who don't know shit about defense basically will just look at any knockout and guess what guess what guess what is a all knockouts have in common Phil the guy's hand is not protecting his chin at the point that it gets touched so literally any knockout, there will be at least a few dozen bozos saying, oh, he should have kept his hands up because you basically don't knock somebody out if they block the punch. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a strong believer in that, in that being a, a catch all form of defense, but it, it, it might matter here because Sean O'Malley is a big time headhunter. He doesn't, he really, the spin kicks, the punches, really focuses on catching his opponent on the chin. And um, Sukumtat had success just covering up with a high guard and marching forward in that third round especially. And even throughout the rest of the fight, it kept them alive. Uh, and this is something Cheeto Vera does. We have seen this work um, notably, for example, when Nate Diaz did it to Conor McGregor. And fans of the show will also know that I love to think very comparatively – um, which is maybe just the dumb guy version of analyzing anything, but I'm always making comparisons in my head. And to me, Sean O'Malley has a lot of Conor McGregor in him with a little bit of like a Stephen Thompson or a Robert Whitaker, a little bit of that, that willingness to dash and leave his stance behind um, and dart in with these sort of straight combinations. But otherwise it's a lot of McGregor. It's a lot of the high kicks and the spin kicks to corral an opponent um, a lot of pressuring with his length and landing clean shots from far away and then stepping back and countering when the opponent is forced to come barreling in after him. And, uh, even more so than Connor, who got better at this over time, more of a headhunter. Uh, and even against McGregor, who throws body shots, Nate was able to just cover up and walk forward under the, the impression that as long as I'm moving forward and he's moving backwards, I'm safer. And as long as I'm covering up high, he's not going to knock me out. Anything that comes to my head, at the very least, is more likely to glance off. And um, I, I do see that being an effective tactic for Chido Vera. And 
probably the biggest part of the McGregor comparison is is what we saw in the third round of that Sukumtot fight. O'Malley really does not seem to like sustained pressure. He seems very uncomfortable when his back is to the fence. Um, and if his stamina is going to fade just from doing what he likes to do, you know, like I, I don't know. He's not going to get to do just what he likes to do in this fight unless he knocks Cheeto out very quickly because Cheeto is going to get in his face. Yeah. Yeah, well that that all makes sense to me. I mean, and I, I've just been rewatching the third round of the of the Terry and Ware fight and mm-hmm. it is also Mhm. I mean, it is ragged and he ends up getting stuck in the clinch. Oh. And Terry and Ware is not famously a particularly devastating clinch fighter. Chido Vera, on the other hand is a very devastating clinch fighter. Yeah. And you know, it's difficult to, it's always difficult to ascertain what people's cardio is going to look like as they move through the UFC. Yeah. Because, I mean, particularly for sort of, you know, young prospect type fighters or those who, you know, might not necessarily be used to this kind of, uh, well, this kind of show. Because for every, uh, Adesanya who looked, you know, a bit ropey, in his first couple of UFC performances. Uh, there's also... Why have I now forgotten the person who was... Uh, Shabazian. Just where Shabazian, you know, had a physical fight and sort of disintegrated a bit against Darren Stewart. And then sort of the exact same thing happened against Derek Lewis. And, like, these were two fights which he was, you know, winning fairly clearly yeah. in the beginning. And then just suddenly wasn't again and for for O'Malley like if you it's the fact that I have not seen him win a decision where he didn't yeah look extremely ragged towards the third round yep other than that it's just been quick easy knockouts yeah Shabazian and, is a real is a real uh reminder of of how how to assess a prospect like you the guys who just are we, you know, the, that bastard Dane Simon has very good advice when he says not to rate somebody too highly off of a losing effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the opposite is true. You have to be looking for the losses in the wins. You have to be looking for, uh, the patterns that it just takes somebody to notice for them to, to exploit the, the, the openings that are there, even in impressive wins. Um, and yeah, for Shabazian, separated by what, three or four fights, the same exact thing that happened in his Darren Stewart fight happened against uh, Derek Brunson. So you have to assume that if this goes past the first round, we are going to see the same arc unfolding. Yeah. Um, and, and ironically enough, this is obviously also exactly the same thing we said about Song Yadong. Is that he, he has really struggled in third rounds. True. But, you know, one of the things is that I think he was probably helped by that more than Vera was helped uh, by the fact that they fought mm-hmm. at featherweight. Uh, this is a bantamweight fight. Mm-hmm. And also, Yudong simply doesn't look as bad in his third round as O'Malley does. No. No, honestly, he yeah. is a He is a physical, pow- physically powerful, like, uh, and, like, notably a very good grappler. I think there was um, a lot more to O'Malley's game, a word that you used earlier, uh, that is a bit illusory. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also like McGregor, like I remember, for example, in his fight with Dustin Poirier, where he he walked out and like put his hands behind his back and and stuck his chin forward, and Dustin Poirier just hit him. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of swagger and confidence that informs this kind of fighting style. Um, that's sometimes a bit of a veneer. You can pop that balloon without too much effort. You just got to find the right spot and. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm taking Cheeto here. The, the real thing is, is like, does he get knocked out? And O'Malley seems super accurate. He seems to have good power, obviously, but I think the accuracy and the timing are really, really the major factors. And, uh, Lord knows he can time Cheeto coming in. He can time Cheeto throwing his sort of like clumsy wooden boxing combinations. Uh, the problem I'm having is until I see it happen, I don't believe Cheeto Vera can be knocked out. I mean, I know he can. But it's really hard to envision it. I do envision him getting hurt a lot and hit with a lot of big shots in the first round. But 
Shit, I think he's less hurtable now than he used to be because he's gained so much in confidence. He's so he knows in his heart that uh sticking to the game plan of pressing the opponent is going to make the fight easier as it goes on. He knows that he's been through that process so many times now. Um so I don't know. It's it's eminently possible that O'Malley might just stop him in round 1, but if he doesn't I do find it hard to imagine that the third round isn't a very, very big one for Cheeto Vera. Yeah, I mean, and looking back at the Yudong fight, I think that's how Featherweight changed that fight, in that it, I think it uh, enhanced both of those dynamics. Yeah. In that it made, it meant that Vera was more able to walk through Song's shots right. early, and it meant that Yudong was able to uh, was able to like have more of his gas tank available to him late. Yeah. Um. So you know, if 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 Cheeto's back down at bantamweight, I think there is probably more of a chance that he gets knocked out. But yeah, I mean, I can barely even think of times where he's actually been hurt. Right. Pretty uncommon. And, and Yudong was absolutely cracking him in that fight, just belting him as hard as he feasibly could. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to pick Cheeto as well. All right. I feel like probably by late stoppage. Yeah, that sounds about right. Late, late stoppage or, um, uh, given, given the, the sort of tone we've established over recent events, uh, late should be a stoppage maybe, mm. but I am seeing a, um, a lot of damage from O'Malley early prolonged beating from Vera, at least in round three. Um, and I will be very impressed having said this, if O'Malley, can pull it together and and stay, you know, stay technical in round three. But I, I'm just not convinced that he can do that yet. Uh, okay. Well, fortunately, you know, we have a lot of time left in this segment, but fortunately this next one, I think can be covered in pretty broad strokes. Uh, that's because it's another heavyweight fight and boy, is it one with great potential for sadness. Junior Dos Santos is fighting Jairzinho Rosenstrike. Both men, of course, famous for getting knocked out by Francis Ngannou and nothing else. Um, and, uh, you know, part, part of the, part of the, the mind, Phil wants to just p- pick Junior because he's been doing this forever and, uh, Rosenstrike is kind of a plotter and we watched Alistair Overeem just basically like, mostly have good success kind of picking him apart from long range with straight shots for many rounds before having his uh, face ripped off. And um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick Rosenstrick. And, and I'll tell you why. Because he's got fast hands and he hits hard and he can counter a jab. And I don't trust JDS. Those are my three reasons. <laughs> okay, what do you got? Yeah, no, I- I- I'm there with you. Uh, yeah, Rosenstrike, uh, yeah, he's, he's got more than one counter to the jab. Um, he's can, he's a good low kicker. Yeah, that too. Um, I mean, JDS is a a good low kicker, but he, I mean, he's a powerful low kicker, but Mm -hmm. he doesn't seem to really know when he wants to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, He's not going to be, uh, JDS doesn't draw people onto shots in the same way that Overeem does. He just sort of stands there at mid range and, and does stuff. Not really uh, a counter puncher, JDS. Sorry, what's that? Not really a counter puncher at all, JDS. No, only the big, yeah, he'll occasionally just try and throw that huge uppercut into the space yeah. which people come into. But all the times we've seen it not land, doesn't it kind of make that Verdum knockout look like a little bit more of an accident of timing? Oh yeah, like I mean, granted, he knew it was going to happen. What else was Verdum going to do? But uh, when they don't do that predictable duck, the uppercut it still comes out. You know, it still comes out and it just misses. Yeah, and so I mean, and it's just yeah, as as you kind of alluded to, JDS has just looked like absolute dog shit lately. Yeah, it really uh, has. he's been throwing his right hand more and more, which has always been his worst punch. Um. He lost a kickboxing match to Curtis Blades and got finished. So, yeah, I'm probably going to pick him to get finished by uh, Rosenstrike. Yeah. I don't even know if Rosenstrike is as like well-developed a striker as Curtis Blades for MMA, honestly. A lot of waiting um, in his game when he's not just instantly knocking someone out. He's probably going to do that. I don't know. Uh, 
But after this, we have some fights that are, well, we have one more fight that matters even less and is far sillier. And I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to it, even though I have nothing substantial to say. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, at the start of the next segment, we are going to talk about John Dodson versus Murab the Wallace Willie. I'm really excited about this one. John Dodson, uh, has turned into such a, I mean, he's really won me over, uh, We'll talk about it in the next segment, but John Dodson filling the role as elite gatekeeper is pretty cool at Bantamweight, and we're going to see if he can do that again, uh, or if Marab Dwalish Willie is indeed a future title contender after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right. Welcome back, one and all, to Heavy Hands. We're talking about John Dodson versus Mirab Dwalish Willie. And um, it's a really fascinating matchup, Phil. I uh, I love John Dodson in the role of a gatekeeper. And, and um, longtime listeners of the show may recall, I think back in the the ancient Wyman era, I think, uh, I think I named John Dodson as my most frustrating fighter. Like the guy that I just had the least fun watching him fight. And I think this was before his fight with John Lineker, which, um, I, leads me to believe that John only had that fight just to make me look stupid for saying that his fights weren't fun and they were frustrating. Um, but you know, around the time of that Zach Makovsky fight, Ooh, boy. Uh, you know, just like not a lot of clear direction in Dodson's game. And I, I just found him very frustrating. I just feel like he didn't make the right decisions. And now as he has started to slow down a bit, um, and is up at bantamweight, he has slotted into this role as, um, gatekeeper to the elite. He really is the sort of, he's the Ryan Bader of the bantamweight division. And that's not as much of an insult as it sounds. Uh, he's, he's just like not quite as fast as he used to be. Uh, so I think it puts him in a lot, uh, matchups that look a lot more like the John Lineker one. This new generation of contenders he's fighting are frequently, you know, very aggressive. Jimmy Rivera is the exception to that, but they're frequently very aggressive. Um, they force him to fight back. And John Dodson's really good when he's fighting back. Uh, he's pretty difficult to just, I mean, you have to be Demetrius Johnson, basically, from what we've seen so far, to lock him down and, and, or, P- and or Peter Yan. Or Peter Yan. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but it's not an easy task to neutralize, uh, John Dodson, even when he's like being put up against the cage. He's quite a good answer to a, a wide variety of, uh, just broadly aggressive opponents. And so that makes a fight with Marab Dwalish really, really interesting. Um, cause Dwalish really is nothing but aggression. It's, it's, it's his whole thing. He's not subtle. He throws everything with full power. Uh, he's one of those guys who probably does hit pretty hard, but because everyone sees every shot coming, you can't tell. Uh, he throws everything hard. He wrestles hard. He always comes forward. He spins at least eight times per fight. Um, he just throws the entire ass kitchen sink at his opponent at every opportunity. And um, I love the idea of John Dodson finding answers to that. Uh, what do you think uh, of the matchup, Phil? What's, what are the, what's the dynamic in your eyes? Yeah, so, I mean, John Dodson is, has always been an interesting case study because he is one of the most athletically gifted MMA fights we've ever seen, in specifically MMA ways as well. Sure. I mean, apart from the the power and the strength and the explosiveness and all that other kind of stuff, uh, you know, one of the pound for pound best chins I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can never remember John Dodson being really badly hurt in a fight. Uh, he gets upset by stuff, and yes. because he's getting he 
he's been beaten up before, but I've never seen him like on wobbly legs and and thought, oh my god, John Dodson is about to get knocked out. I don't think ever. He's eaten some disgusting shots. I'm really trying to um, think of it now, and I I can't either. Even up at bantamweight. Yeah. Um, those knees that DJ was landing, tons of the shots that Peter Yarn hit him with. I was just like, how? Yeah. I mean, he clearly didn't want to be there anymore, but yeah. Anyway. It's like it, it sort of gasses um, him to take too many shots, but it doesn't ever really rock him. Yeah. Um, but for all that, I've always been a bit more, um, I've always been a, a bit more lenient on, on John Dodson than a lot of other people have, in part because I, I think I'd, I knew him, I, I've watched more of his fights before the UFC and sort of, you know, contemporaneously rather than watching them back. Mm -hmm. So like the context for what a frustrating John Dodson fight for me is, is always like the bar has always been set by that absolutely baffling split decision loss to Mike Easton where you just looked, I just looked at him and thought, what are you doing? Yes. What, what, why, why are you just sitting there trading low kicks with this man? Um, so I mean, for all his slow fights that he had in the UFC, there were very few of them where you thought he should win this fight and he didn't. And it wasn't clear. No one, you know, the, the Makovsky fight was not interesting, but I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't exciting, but John Dodson won it easily on the cards. Uh, he never had any of these. He he was never self sabotaging in those fights. That's that's what I'm trying to say. Like many sort of tepid athletic fighters, I'm gonna fact check uh, he you never on had. That. I'm gonna I'm gonna fact check you on that. I remember that Dodson Makovsky decision being slightly controversial. But uh, please go on. I'll, I'll 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 report to tell you how how wrong you are in a moment. Um. Oh no! So yeah, everyone agreed um, Dawson won. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm wrong. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. It I can't have to... be. It <laughs> can't be because you had uh, Zach Makovsky on the show just before then, can it? That no. you remember it being much closer. No. What are you accusing me of, Phil? Some sort of <laughs> tendency towards bias? Uh, I would never do that. Um. That's why I like you because you're nice to me. <laughs> 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 anyway, go on. But yeah, I think of the people who have beaten Dodson, there has been a level of technicality, yeah, uh, which is not present with Devalishvili, um, yeah. and a level of uh, skill in the first layer. Because whilst I'm sure that Devalishvili can wear out a physically waning John Dodson should he get him in the clinch, and this is still a you know a strong possibility in this fight. And it's going to be one of those fights where I think the first round will probably tell us how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Because if Devalishvili can consistently get the clinch at all, or even if he can get the clinch, you know, if he, if he can get contro to control positions for, like, a minute of the first round, I think he's probably going to win. But um, other than that, he's so wild. He is not a quick-footed man, mm -hmm. although he has sort of started moving a lot more uh in his in his later fights he's he's no longer plodding around he's bouncing aimlessly around um <laughs> and i'm just not sure how he's going to like track dodson down with the, getting punched hard one thing that he has started doing is throwing tons of raw kicks which makes which does make sense from two angles i think in this fight in the firstly it will serve to some way to corral uh, Dodson's mm -hmm. uh, lateral movement. And secondly, it does mean that it will give us the requisite oh, yes. uh, disgusting John Dodson nut shot. At least one. There's yeah. simply no way around it. Especially not in this matchup. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 sh I share your concerns about the clinch in particular because... Uh, famously, John Dodson got nothing done in that phase against Demetrius Johnson. Um, he was really, really frustrated. And I think, I think really like the frustrating thing about John Dodson from, from a viewing standpoint is he's just not good at making his fight happen. You have to bring his fight to him. Um, cause we were saying this before. You said that someone like DeWalsh, really someone who comes forward and throws like insane volume is his ideal fight. And then you're like, eh, maybe not his ideal fight. 
it's closer to his ideal fight than something like the Makovsky one, though. Um, mm-hmm. you know, a similarly like neutral sort of fighter where, yeah, Dodson can, can land the better shots and win and everything, but like coming up with, with, with counters uh, is great. Um, and this, this, this happens in the clinch as well because he, he'll get into the clinch. He knows he's losing. He knows he needs to get out, but he's just not that proactive. Like the opening has to be given to him. But um, it's hard to think of someone who just gives more openings than Marav Dwellish Willie. Because you, it, it, as you said, it's, it is really – it's not the first layer that gets it done. It's the accumulation uh, of everything. It is – it's it's Colby Covington. He is just – he's a pace fighter. And um, have you ever seen someone like that beat John Dodson? I mean, John Lineker is, is obviously the – yeah, but John Lineker is like a craftier striker, um, mm-hmm. a harder striker, and also like that fight was razor close. Yeah, I'm still of the opinion that John Dodson right. won that. Yeah, there's a very good argument for John Dodson winning that fight. Um, so the, the difference here is really is the clinch, like I said, because unlike John Lineker, Dwellish really has the wrestling game to mix in. It's really what he wants. John Dodson has always been tremendously difficult to take down, very difficult to hold down, uh, especially when he's up against the cage. But perhaps because he uses that cage so well to stay upright, he's not really been great at getting out of the clinches and, um, and breaking away from there. So, but, but that sort of presupposes a win in which Dwellish Willie is neutralizing him. And I can't honestly imagine Dwellish Willie allowing himself to even win that fight. I can't imagine him imagine him allowing himself to have that fight because he's going to want to keep doing stuff. He's not patient enough, I don't think, to just tie up and allow Dodson to stall out his chain wrestling if indeed Dodson can. You mentioned before you you thought the Wallace Willie's chain wrestling had taken a, had been upgraded. What 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 have you seen that makes you think that? Uh it was pretty much just the Casey Kenny fight. Mm-hmm. Uh I mean because before he would pretty much just look for like uh, underhooks and just haul the other guy down, but we really saw him like shifting his targets, going for trips, going for the single leg. Like he was search, he was cycling through uh, wrestling techniques. Yeah, uh, which you know makes sense for who he is as a person, and it worked very well against Kenny. But but does that know, just same- allow Dodson to get free? That he has to keep changing. Cause Dot, Dotson is, he's so hard. Even Demetrius Johnson couldn't take him down very, very often. He had to win the uh, rematch in the clinch mostly. And I think he only started to actually finish his takedowns like in the fourth and fifth rounds. So does the fact that DeWalsh really can't just get to the clinch and chip away, he's going to try chain wrestling, which is normally a great idea. Does that give Dodson an out to get back to his range and reset? I don't know. I I I I I I, I feel like Dodson's going to win this. Uh, yeah. I mean, the main thing for John Dodson is obviously that he is, you know, and going back to why you disliked him, getting not only an incredible athlete but an incredibly athletically dependent fighter. Yes. Um, and he's clearly on. He's also clearly on the downslope. Sure. The guy that we're seeing out there now is is obviously not the person who was like. Knocking down Demetrius with yeah. four punch combinations, but he also clearly uh, hasn't fallen off yet. Yeah, but yeah, simultaneously we saw in the wood fight that there is enough in the tank there mm-hmm. for now. So yeah, I'll take John Dodson uh, probably by a decision that might get a bit dicey down the stretch, just because if he can't knock Davalish really out, he does seem disgustingly tough. Yep. Um, if he can't knock him out, then he might just get. You know, just the sheer like pace and physicality of the fight might be wearing on him late. Yep, I, I can definitely see that happening. Um, it's a great dynamic for a matchup. Like uh, mm-hmm. John Dawson is still eminently capable of frustrating me, but um, you know, Dwalish Willie is going to bring the fight to him, and uh, Dawson is always entertaining when that happens. So, very much looking forward to that one. A meaningful fight. Again, I, I don't know. I, I guess this just, this just reveals me to be like a, 
like a, a sort of shallow and easily manipulated person. But once John Dodson starts to slip, becomes a little bit more of an underdog in my eyes, I start to like him. Um, so I'm sorry, John, that you had to get kind of bad before I, before I gave you the props. But, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing if he can do it again. Uh, all right. Enough about that shit. Phil, when this fight happened the first time, I think it was so funny that I forgot about it. Uh, because I, I looked at this matchup, Magomed Ankalaya versus Iwan Kutalaba 2. I looked at those two names and I was like, oh, this is cool. All right. This is good. <laughs> and then last week, you mentioned to me, you're like, remember when he, um, uh, Kudalaba acted like he was rocked and he did such a good job of it that the ref stopped the fight. <laughs> and I rewatched it and it was like I'd never seen it before and it blew my mind. <laughs> I was losing my shit, cackling at this <laughs> insane 30 seconds of fighting. There's absolutely no way the rematch can be as good. This is really just an opportunity for us to reminisce <laughs> about the first one because there's nothing that perfect is ever going to happen again. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, this was just phenomenal. This was like, this was like Argo where <laughs> acting was so good that it, it kind of came in, it kind of affected the real world. I mean, not only was Ivan Kutalaba like such a good actor that he he convinced an M- a referee to stop a fight, an MMA he was such ref. a good fight actor that he convinced an MMA referee to stop a fight to stop a fight standing. I know. Was... Can you imagine what kind of presence this guy has as an actor? <laughs> Put this like, man on what... the stage. He's so compelling. Yeah, I mean. With just a few motions of his body, he can accomplish what a regular person getting completely buzzsawed and smashed into the fence by hundreds of punches and going face down in a pool of their own blood, like, can't do. He can do it just by wibbling. Like, what a remarkable man. It really just... And he's, he's then so insanely upset yes. his own his own acting skill afterwards. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I imagine Kudalaba in a movie puts on this tear-jerking performance and then he's just running around the theater screaming because he realizes people are crying. <laughs> no! It was fake! <laughs> he was so mad when the fight got stopped, I which I understand. to believe that much. <laughs> just enough! Just, <laughs> it's all pretend. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he really convinced everyone. Um, they pass him his, they pass him his Oscar and he just decks the actor giving it to him and storms <laughs> off in fury. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I think I added this to the docker for the show without having any intention of technically breaking down the fight. I just wanted to revisit the first one. Um, uh, any notion of what's going to happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, sure, Ankala is probably still gonna win, right? Yeah, um, Kudalaba. Kudalaba doesn't, as we said last time, he doesn't win against people who do the takedown good. Yep. And Ankala does the takedown good. I mean, but he didn't have to bother last time. Right. Was he, in fact, should be more concerning for Kudalaba. Right. Although, um, yeah. All I hope is that something, like, hilarious does does happen. I mean, I can't live up to that because that was legitimately one one of the funniest things I've ever seen in MMA. Yeah. But, like, at least we know that, like, um, which one of the seven deadly sins is uh, Kutalaba's, like, light heavyweight um, sin. He's definitely wrath. He's he's Uh, wrath, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Daniel Cormier is probably MV. Is Ed Herman Ooh. now sloth? That just seems mean. No, but yes. he's not sloth. He's not. He works very hard, Ed Herman. Yeah, I know, but he is a very slow man. Yeah, but that's uh, not what sloth means. Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, Ankle is probably going to win this, and probably on the ground. But uh, as what was what was it you said in your predictions for the rematch? A long time ago. Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh, only... that, um, 
someone's head was going to go flying into the bleachers. I remember that. But I yeah, the only way it could be funny would be <laughs> funnier if something like oh uh, yes, yes, Chris yes. <laughs> throws Ankalaev out of the cage, who is pro- falls into Paul Craig's lap and is promptly triangled. <laughs> he lands head first in Paul Craig's lap. Yeah, yeah. Ankalaev beats him for two and a half rounds and then gets flung into Paul Craig's triangle. That's it. Um, <laughs> there, nothing could be funnier than what happened in the first fight. You're right. Uh, Kudalaba just too mad, uh, too extremely mad. Um, way too gung-ho about destroying people early. I mean, it could happen. Uncle I have definitely seemed down to exchange. Um, but e- even then, I don't, I don't even see Kudalaba as a particularly notable one-shot knockout threat in this division. Like, he knocked out Khalil Roundtree and Enrique De Silva, which is something. I mean, certainly, um, my boy, uh, Frank Waston is, is, has been durable in the past. But yeah, it's got to be the grappler, and uh, that's got to be the end of our show for this week. Um, I don't know about you, Phil, but I haven't read shit as MMA related all week, uh, so I got nothing of anyone else's to plug, and I'm just working on uh, private scouting shit over here, so I certainly don't have any articles to plug. What about you? Um, so. There are actually a couple of things I want to plug. So, uh, yes. I mentioned last week, um, I read, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, Danny Martin's, uh, metagame series. I think he has now, uh, updated that. Mm-hmm. And there's a new one out on, uh, prioritization. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm also, it has one of my, uh, like, it has a quote from me. Full mm. disclosure in it, but it is a quote where I'm talking about how good Ronda Rousey is. Mm. So, um, it's, so it, it doesn't make, it doesn't paint me in the most flattering light, although I will note that in, that was, I think, for, for the preview for Nunez Rousey, where I did obviously pick Nunez to win. I'm not crazy. And um, yet you're plugging his shit. Here he is, embarrassing you, reminding everyone of your worst takes, and you still plug him. Uh, the other thing I read was, um, a fan post by a friend of the show, uh, Knockout Ned on mm-hmm. Bloody Elbow, mm-hmm. uh, called Indeed Community College Wrestling is Strong. Mm. And I'll be retweeting this on, uh, on the Twitters, which is basically saying that, uh, pointing out that, uh, junior and community college wrestlers often do better than those who go to like stellar college careers. Yeah, it's true. You know, for, uh, in MMA, and you know, for a few reasons that, that you might, uh, expect, which Ned elaborates on, including, you know, wear and tear and just, um, getting used to the, um, you know, getting used to the subtleties and nuances of MMA and not sort of filling up, uh, mental space with, uh, wrestling specifics. But yeah, sort great piece. Maybe ties into the prioritization angle as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So those those make a pretty strong one too. Uh, I would recommend checking them out. Very cool. Uh, that that uh, wrestling piece um, sounds great. Danny's piece sounds like shit, but that wrestling one sounds really really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so go check both of those out. Thank you, Phil, for actually doing some reading this week. Um, and that's it for today's episode. Make sure you find us on social media if you have any comments, questions, criticisms, uh, c- canards. Um, uh, uh, caustic c- conversational quips. Boy, I didn't think I could do it. Uh, you can find Phil on there at Evil Greg Jackson and myself at Boxing Bush, B U S C H. And uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, if you want to hear us talking about Derek Lewis versus Alexi Alinek, uh, if you want to hear us talking about Chris Weidman versus Omar Akhmedov, which was everything we hoped it would be and more, um, and whatever else, Benil Dario certainly from last week's event make sure you check out the heavy hands patreon it's just three bucks a month to get access to all of our bonus episodes and we're gonna have a few good ones coming to you also because each time i mention it on the show i hear from this son of a bitch online i sent this historical perspective to kyle mcclough okay and i sent it to the right one i didn't even get it wrong as i sometimes do and email the actor so you have to yell at him now about getting that put up on the Patreon. He has to edit his own three and a half hours of insane rambling. And we'll see how long it takes him to do that impossible task. Uh, But until next time, thank you all so much for listening. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, 
you know you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Oh, yeah. Body shots.